All right, I'm gonna mute everybody now and we're gonna get started. Let me see, mute all. Okay, so hello everybody and uh, uh, welcome to this very special map event on this cold September, early September evening in Colorado. For all of you that are not from Colorado, this may look very unusual, but uh, it is not, especially during this time of the year in Colorado. Uh, so this, uh, this is what happens uh, every once in a while. Uh, my name is Angel Abud Madrid, and I'm the president of the Rocky Mountain Map Society. And on uh, behalf of uh, my fellow members of the board, we welcome you to this, our very first remote event. Uh, now, this is not the usual way that we gather to talk and, and listen to, uh, to talks about maps, but remote is not an unusual word in maps. In fact, what you're going to see today is a variety of maps from several of our members that are all from very remote places from all over the world. At a time when information took a long time to come from the source to the map. So what you will see in many of these maps, it's a lot of misinformation, mythical figures, uh, imaginary lakes and, 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 and notions, but that's what makes uh, antique maps so unique. So let's not fear remote, uh, embrace it. In fact, this is what allows us to be everywhere around the globe and communicate at the very same time uh, so that we can have the chance to enjoy the beauty, the mystery and the timeless fascination with maps. So with that, let's get started. And I'm going to uh, turn it over to Naomi Heiser, who is our uh, program uh, coordinator, who has been instrumental in keeping the heart of the society beating through all these hard times. And she has put together a great program for the fall, along with other programs with other societies. You know, that's the beauty of remote. You can see maps from everywhere, from every society. So let's, let's enjoy uh, whatever we can from this time. So Naomi, I'm gonna turn uh, the, uh, uh, not the floor, but I'll give the screen to you at this time. Hi everyone, it's nice to see faces again. And I can't wait until we can get together and um, have faces in the same room back at the Denver Public Library. Uh, we've got two more programs coming up in September. One of them is just this week. Um, John Doctor already mentioned that one for you all who were here when he talked about it. Um, so September 10th, that's just two days from now at five o'clock mountain time. Um, John Hessler from the Library of Congress and John Hopkins University is going to present on the Mapping COVID-19 project. And then September 22nd, we have Derek Van Westrom of the NOAA uh, facility in Boulder. So our local NOAA expert who's going to give a talk called A Mile High Above What Exactly? And it's about the new U.S. datum um, that he helps to measure. And um, he'll talk about whether some of our 14ers, which are some of Colorado and Colorado's most um, favorite things to do. I don't know if you all know about hiking the 14ers, but he's going to talk about how some of them may not be 14ers after the new datum is applied. We'll have to see which ones he's talking about. We also have programs in um, October, two of them, um, and then another in November and another in December. And these have been um, coordinated for the most part with other map societies around the country. And you can find all the information you need through our emails. Um, through the website or through our Facebook page. And if you are not on our email list and want to be, just email me. Um, you can find that information. I'll put it in the chat for you. Um, and you can get on our email list for the rest of the schedule. But it's a wonderful, huge program of events because of collaborations with the other US MAP societies. So um, tonight's program, like Angel said, is seven of our members who are going to talk about um, their favorite maps. And if any of you in the audience would like to become a member and you aren't one already, we would love to have you. It's a very reasonable price of $25. So if you would like to become a member, just let any of us on the board know. Um, Jim is going to be our gracious chat monitor tonight, Jim Hensinger. So um, if you have questions for each of the speakers as they're speaking, please put them in the chat. And Jim is going to monitor that and hopefully um, there'll be enough time to answer one or two questions after each speaker. All right, so with that, um, we will get going. So let me share my screen. We're gonna start with Christopher Lane. Oops, let me back up. All right, Chris, 
You can go ahead and unmute yourself, Chris. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, I'm very excited about this program. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, I've been selling antique maps and prints for 38 years, uh, the last 10 of which at the Philadelphia Print Shop West in Denver. And uh, I got into the business because it's a hobby, especially uh, I love antique maps. And it's a, um, a fondness I share with my wife, Lindsay. And uh, we decided early on that we wanted to collect, uh, but because I didn't want to compete, I had a partner at the time, Don Cresswell, and I didn't want to compete with the print shop. So we decided we would collect British maps. My wife is British. And also in particular, Oxfordshire maps, because that is where we met and fell in love. And we're still in love, although we don't live in Oxford anymore. But anyway, one of my all time favorite maps is this uh, Michael Drayton map of Oxford, Buckinghamshire, and Berkshire from 1612. The idea of doing a series of maps showing the parts of England and Wales began in the court. Uh, I, I kind of jumped ahead, Naomi, if you could go to the next one, sorry. There you go. Uh, the idea of doing a series of maps showing the parts of England and Wales began in the court of Queen Elizabeth I. At the suggestion of her chief advisor, William Cecil, in 1573, Elizabeth ordered the creation of an atlas of detailed maps of her realm. The resulting publication by Christopher Saxon was published in 1579 and it included 35 maps of groups of counties. This image is of a map of Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire, and Berkshire. Saxon's is considered to be the first atlas published to focus on only one country in particular, and it established a long tradition of subsequent atlases of the parts of the British Isles by such figures as John Speed, Robert Morden, and others. One of the earliest of these English atlases was by Michael Drayton, who lived from 1563 to 1631. But its origins were artistic rather than topographic. Drayton was a prominent poet in the Elizabethan court. Drayton wrote a poem about the beauties and wonders of England and Wales entitled the Polyabion, that is Greek for having many blessings. Or it was also called a chronological description of all the tracts, rivers, mountains, forests, and other parts of the renowned Isle of Great Britain. The poem was very lengthy, 15,000 lines, and consisted of 30 songs, each written about a group of about three counties. To accompany most of the songs, Drayton commissioned William Hole to produce a map of the subject counties. The first part was issued in 1612 and it included 18 maps, and the delayed second part, which wasn't issued until 1622, included another 10. Supposedly, Drayton planned a third part relating to Scotland, but that never appeared. Now, Hole's maps are relatively generally, are generally accurate uh, outline of the areas they show, but they focus on the subject of Drayton's poem rather than on the top topography. They feature almost exclusively the coasts, valleys, rivers, and forests. Instead of topographical features, Hole populated his maps with allegorical figures, including water and wood nymphs, shepherds representing the countryside, and women personifying some of the cities. This is one of my favorite maps, and like the Saxon maps I showed, it illustrates Oxford, Buckinghamshire, and Berkshire. Drayton shows a number of the topographical features of the area, including the larger forests, the Vale, I need, yeah, there we go, the Vale of the White Horse, and a figure with a city perched on her head, which represents Oxford. The central motif, however, is related to the formation of the Thames River. The source of the Thames, of the Thame, excuse me, which is one of the source rivers, is shown as a male figure arising in the Vale of Aylesbury. And the source of the Isis, the other source river of the Thames, is shown as a female figure arising in the west. Then at a spot where the two join to create the Thames, the two river nymphs are shown with an elaborate wedding ceremony. Um, sorry, I need another click. I didn't put that one in. There we go. Uh, the wedding ceremony. Note that up to the Victorian times, 
what is today called the Thames above Dorchester was called the Isis. So now what this shows is the Isis was the Thames. But you can see here this wedding ceremony uh, of, the, of Isis and Tame. Unfortunately for Drayton, his work was not well received and few copies of this map were printed. Still, Drayton is buried in Poet's Corner in Westminster Abbey and his maps are much sought after for their uniqueness and beauty. And this is one of Lindsay's and my absolute favorite maps. Are we good to go? Or are you going to answer any questions, Chris? Okay. Were there any questions? Jim? No, I see no questions. We should proceed, I think. All righty. I have a question. Chris? Yes. Is, is, is this map often for sale? Or is it, uh, is it a, kind of a rare item? Uh, they're pretty rare. The Drayton maps, there are not many of them around. Um, you can find them, especially of some of the, the more obscure counties. Oxfordshire has a lot of people interested. And by the way, I don't know if anybody can see me, but here is the actual map in my hand up on the wall. Um, so the, you know, uh, Oxford, the one of London, the one of Cornwall tend to be harder to find, but you can find them around. They, they do come up on the market. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Naomi. Yeah. Naomi, you're muted. Lorraine, you can go ahead and give your introduction and then I'll share the screen and start your slide presentation. Okay, great. Well, hi everyone. I'm Lorraine Sherry presenting my Willem Blau map of Russia. I bought it from Barry Ruderman at an RMMS map fair more than 10 years ago. Why? Because as a third generation Lithuanian American, I wanted to know where my ancestors came from. So let's look at the first slide. Okay, uh, slide first, what, what, go back one please to the beginning. Great, thanks. The Russia map is gorgeous with a beautiful cartouche, sketches of local people, an inset map of the city of Moscow, and the watershed of the Volga River, all drawn in minute detail. The engraver, Hessel Geritz, dedicated the map to Tsar Michael Romanov on being crowned Tsar of all the Russias in 1614. Next slide, please. Willem Blau was one of the foremost publishers of maps and atlases in Amsterdam during what we term the golden age of Dutch cartography. And that's Max Peters' bailiwick, basically. My copy of the Russia map was published by Blau in his Atlas Major, 1664 edition. The engraver was Hessel Geritz, who was considered one of the chief Dutch cartographers of the 17th century. He started out as an apprentice to Willem Blau, and many of his maps wound up in atlases published by Blau, Jansen, and others. Garretts is the same engraver who created the famous 1613 Lithuania four-part wall map for Prince Nicholas Radziwill, then ruler of Lithuania. Same Radziwill family as Jackie Kennedy's brother-in-law. Next slide. This is what the cartouche reads. And let's start with that roughly translated from the Latin, and it is long. What does the czar of all the Russias mean? It's complicated. Isn't Russia a nation? It wasn't always one. It started with several major Viking settlements and Rus lands. Back in the 800s, when Rurik the Viking was plying his trade on the ancient amber route between the Baltics and Constantinople, what is now Russia was just a collection of warring Slavic tribes. The Vikings founded Novgorod, south of Lake Ladoga in 854. There were two major Viking trade routes, the northern route 
following the Dnieper River through Russia, and the southern route following the Dniester River through Ukraine. A winding northern trade route went from the Gulf of Finland to Novgorod, to Kiev, to the Dnieper River, to the Black Sea, and Constantinople. And the next slide will show some of those trade routes. To protect his cargo, Rurik the Viking negotiated with the local tribal leaders along the Dnieper River to unite those local tribes under his protection. And then he founded Kiev in 882. This tribal confederation was known as the Rus, and that's the origin of the name Russia. Later, Rurik's descendants declared themselves princes like Prince Igor. They expanded their territory southward from Novgorod to Kiev and inland to Vladimir and Suzdal province in 990. The Rurik dynasty continued until 1584 when Ivan the Terrible died of a stroke. This Viking trade maps, uh, trade routes map actually from Novgorod to Kiev to the Black Sea is a good way to orient ourselves on the Blau map. But where's Moscow? Founded in 1147, Moscow was just a little fortified town near the big trading town of Vladimir. It gained power in the 1300s under the Muscovite rulers, and meanwhile, Kiev became the capital of Ukraine and flourished with the Dnieper River trade. Next slide, please. The Blau map cartouche refers to Grand Duke of Moscow, Michael Romanov, as Great Lord, Grand Duke, and Tsar of all the Russias, ruler of Vladimir, Moscow, Novgorod, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, naming these various main cities. So what are all the Russias? There are three. Russia proper, Great Russia is the core of old Russia. Malinky Rus, Little Russia is mostly Ukraine. And Belarus, White Russia is the eastern half of modern Belarus. The hereditary title of Tsar from the Roman Caesar was created in 988 when Prince Vladimir of Kiev married Anna, sister of the last Byzantine emperor, Basil II. He took Basil's credentials as the Eastern Roman emperor and Christianized Russia. Then in this time goes on. In the 16th century, the last Rurik Tsar, Ivan the Terrible, Grand Prince of Moscow, murdered most of his family, including the crown prince and his pregnant wife, told his own eight wives to get thee to a nunnery, and died of a stroke in 1584. <laughs> the royal succession was worse than Godfather Part One. Next slide, please. In the Blau map cartouche, Hessel Gerritz mentions three czars. Handsome dudes, aren't they? His cartouche marks the following events. The end of the 700-year-old Rurik dynasty with Ivan the Terrible, the time of troubles under Boris Budinov, and the beginning of a new dynasty with Michael Romanov, which lasted until 1917. And the story belongs in the tabloids. Mussorgsky's opera, Boris Budinov, only tells part of the tale. We'll hear more. And the Lithuanians were definitely involved. Ivan the Terrible had two remaining heirs, his autistic son, Fyodor, who obviously was unfit to rule, and Dmitri, the son of his eighth wife, the last of the Ruriks. Fyodor's regent, Boris Budinov, was elected the next czar and thus began the time of troubles for Russia. Famine, poverty, and anarchy. To add, to, add to the chaos, two imposters from neighboring Lithuania arrived on the scene, each pretending to be Dmitri, the true heir to the throne. Next slide. Where was the real Dmitri? Considered, the Ill, considered illegitimate by the Orthodox Church, the boy was exiled to the little town of Uglit. Uglit, it's hard to pronounce. Lived in a monastery there and was murdered in 1591. Well, think like Godfather parts two and three. I wasn't there, so I couldn't have done it. Well, the people were furious. After Boris Gudunov died in April 1605 while playing chess, the anti gudunov boyars murdered his entire, his entire family in June as a vendetta, and things just got worse. Next slide. In 1613, the Russian 
parliament, known as the Zemsky Sogor, finally took charge and elected Mikhail Fyodorovich Theo Romanov, Grand Duke of Moscow, as the next Tsar. Michael was the grand nephew of Ivan's first wife, Anastasia Romanov, and his father was the Patriarch of Moscow. So you got the church and the state together there. He united the boyars, started a new dynasty, and conquered most of Siberia. As Tsar of all the Russias, Michael Romanov ruled from the Moscow Kremlin, which we visited. In Russia, in Russian, a Kremlin just means a citadel or a castle within a city or town. The city of Moscow has huge stone walls with towers that encircle the Kremlin, Red Square, St. Basil's, a park, the nunnery, royal buildings and churches, three bridges, and military encampments. It is huge. It's an imp impressive city now. But what did it look like in Michael Romanov's time? Next slide, please. The city of Moscow is located in the watershed of the Volga River on a cliff overlooking the Moscow River. A map of Moscow appears in the upper left corner of the blau map, and here it is. It's a copy of the 1572 through 1617 print collection, Civitates Orbis Terrarum, which means Cities of the World, by Brown and Hogenberg. The inset is the Moscow map's first appearance in print. It's been copied by many other 17th century cartographers, including John Speed. The engraving is meticulous. You need a magnifying glass to see the details. A tourist map, a tourist map might help, but thankfully, Brown and Hogenberg included a place list. I marked the main places. Finally, the brand new czar needed to know the boundaries and extent of his empire. But did he commission the map? And who did the survey? Or was it just another map on Blau's Atlas? We'll never know, but it took me three days to figure out the boundaries. Last slide, please. Can we go to the last slide, please? Thanks. Michael Romanov was great lord, czar of all the Russians, and so, oops, <laughs> back one. There we go. Michael Romanov was the great lord, Tsar of all the Russias, etc., etc. But the cartouche also names him Tsar of Kazan, Astrakhan, Siberia, etc. Uh, we need to go forward. One more slide, please, Naomi. There we go. Russian boundaries. Okay. Uh, Kazan, Astrakhan, Siberia, and multiple others are eastern territories that were conquered by Ivan the Terrible, which were added to all the Russias. Thus, in 1614, the natural boundaries of Russia were, to the north, Swedish and Finnish territories, including Karelia and the Sea of Murmansk. To the east, the Volga River to the Caspian Sea. To the west, the Davina River, that's the border with Livonia, which is now Estonia and Latvia, and the Dnieper River, a little further south, which is the border with Lithuania and Ukraine. Finally, the border to the south is the Don River and a stockade, which just kind of looks like a beige smear partway down. And the inscription says, Tsar Fyodor Ivanovich built this wall to keep the Crimean Tartars out. Sound familiar? But I think Boris just had it built and just used Fyodor's name. During Michael's reign, Russia kept acquiring new lands by treaty, war, or invasion. And by the time he died, Russia stretched all the way to the Pacific Ocean, and the rest is history. That's all, folks. <clears throat> Lorraine, there is, there is a question. Yes. Uh, does the cat have a favorite map? The cat is being a royal pain in the neck right now. <laughs> when I'm talking and she doesn't know who's at the other end of the uh, of my screen, she gets confused and can't figure out why I'm talking to nothing. Thank you. Any other questions? Anything else? Okay, Naomi, we can move on and I will mute myself. Um. Next up, we have Tom Overton. 
Um, and Tom, if there's a lag time with the slides, like it seemed like was happening um, here with Lorraine's presentation at the end, just let me know or somebody let me know um, that you're not seeing the right slide, okay? It won't be a problem. You wanna introduce yourself, please? Sure, uh, first of all, I wanna say thanks to Naomi and Angel for pulling this together. I know it takes a lot of work it doesn't look like it takes a lot of work, but it does. And it's uh, really nice to see several of our friends from other MAP societies around the country on the line as well. I uh, hope this is something that we will all be able to continue. Um, so my name is Tom Overton. I've been collecting maps since college. Uh, I've been involved with the Rocky Mountain Map Society for, oh, I'm not sure, 15 to 20 years. Uh, it got interested uh, met Jim Hensinger and Wes Brown and Don McGurk and several others was just uh, got me really excited about maps and learning and uh, that's why we're here. Tonight I'm going to talk about a uh, map that's relatively new to me. Uh, I uh, picked this map up when I was in um, Thailand on business a couple of years ago and the more I study it the uh, more interesting it becomes. Um, so we're just going to hit a couple of high points tonight. The uh, title of the map is the map of the Kingdom of Siam and the surrounding countries. It was published in 1686 and it's considered the most important map of the Kingdom of Siam published in the 17th century. Uh, before getting very far into this, I want to apologize in advance for butchering the pronunciation of almost every name I'm going to use tonight. Um, map depicts the arrival of the first French embassy to the Kingdom of Siam in what is now Thailand. Uh, the map is dedicated to the Chevalier de Chaumont, uh, who led the delegation. Uh, Chaumont was the French ambassador to Siam, and his title uh, basically means that he was a knight. Um, the map depicts the sea route from just west of the Sunda Straits between Sumatra and Java, and then north through the Baca Straits, past the location of present-day Singapore, and up the east side of the peninsula of the Gulf of Siam. And I think when we blow this up, you'll be able to see that a little bit better. Uh, the Siamese king, uh, Narai, would, hang on a second, Naomi, I'll tell you when, uh, wished to manage European contact with his country, and he preferred the French to the Dutch and the English. In 1680, the French East India Company sent a ship to Thailand. And that same year, the Siamese had attempted to establish an embassy in France, but the ambassador's sh ship was wrecked near an island off the east coast of Africa. Uh, Siam did succeed in sending a delegation to France in 1684, and in part because of their exotic clothing and manners, the Siamese were met with a rapturous reception that caused a sensation in the courts and the society of France. Uh, in an audience with King Louis XIV, the Siamese requested that the French send an embassy to establish an embassy in Siam, and Louis responded favorably, and he sent Chevalier de Chamont the following year, uh, and the two Siamese ambassadors uh, who had come to France returned to Siam with de Chamont, and the de delegation arrived in 1685, the year before this map. Now, as I think all of you know, Louis XIV was known as the Sun King, and France was the leading European power at the time. There are several 16th century maps that show Europe's exploration of, in the East and its interaction with Asia. However, Thailand was less known. Uh, the maps of the period focused on the discoveries in the Spice Islands. And now, Naomi, if you could get the next slide, please. This is obviously a um, contemporary map of of uh, Southeast Asia and that part of the world. Uh, the Spice Islands, I don't have a pointer, but you can see the large island of New Guinea and uh, the island of Borneo. The Spice Islands are more or less between uh, those two larger islands. To reach the Spice Islands from Europe, the ship didn't have to sail along the coast or across the Gulf of Thailand. And as a result, Thailand was on the fringe of maps in the first half of the century. The next slide, please. Uh, 
Uh, the country's designation as Siam by Westerners likely came from the Portuguese who had reached the Malay Peninsula by 1455. Uh, the name Siam came from a Sanskrit word. It was adopted by the Portuguese in the 16th century and became an accepted geographical term. The Gulf of Siam was first named on a Portuguese manuscript map in 1517, so that's pretty early. And the name Siam became enshrined in the geographical nomenclature until 1939 when the name of the country changed to Thailand. At the time, the region was known as Ayutthaya. Uh, the contemporary map on the left is cut uh, to do my best to show you uh, exactly what's being portrayed in the uh, map from 1686. Uh, Thailand's strength was often underrated in the Western accounts uh, because it was overshadowed by the Spice Islands. However, it was the most powerful kingdom in Southeast Asia and it controlled an area, an area extending south to the Malay Peninsula, west to, to lower Burma and northeast to what we uh, know as northeastern Thailand today. Uh, this time period was considered the golden age of Siamese culture. And this map reflects an incre increasing French influence. And it also uh, is the first to show results of surveys from the interior. Um, historically, what was going on in 1675, about eight years before this uh, map was published, a European, a person from Greek, became an official at the court of Thailand. Um, and following the troubles with the English and the Dutch, he established harmonious relationships with the French, uh, and he permitted the French to station soldiers and build a fortress in Bangkok. Uh, however, after the European, and he was a Greek person, uh, after his benefactor, the king died, he was removed from power in 1688, and the French were expelled that year, which was two years after this map was published. And after that, Thailand adopted an isolationist policy and cut off contact with Europe for approximately 150 years until about the mid 19th century. Uh, so this was um, most of the information that we had uh, at that time period. Uh, next slide, Naomi. Uh, the title of this atlas is Geographic Maps. It's by Father Placide and Augustin de Chaucher, I think. Uh, we'll come back to them in a second. I did want to point out, um, the, like almost every atlas you've ever seen, there's a page that describes uh, this one in Old French, the, the uh, what's depicted on the map. And then this is a later copy, a later state of the, the map that we're talking about tonight. And the next slide. Um, the map we're discussing is attributed to Pierre Duval. Uh, it was actually issued by Duval's widow after his death with the assistance of Duval's brother-in-law, Father Placide and Augustin de Chasse. And these three carried on the family business after Duval's death including the publication of the atlas in the prior slide. Um, with respect to this particular map, it's clear that Duval all but finished the map prior to his death in 1683, which is three years before the actual publication. Uh, there is a small antecedent map attributed to Sanson, which was uh, Duval's uncle. Um, and it appears to have been drawn by Duval. And it's um, worth noting that with this map, we're not only seeing the first uh, information we have about the area, uh, we're seeing the development of one of the most important map publishing families of Europe, Sanson to Duval and on to De Chaus. Uh, next slide, please. I want to look at some of the particulars of the map very quickly. Um, I think that title here is a splendid cartouche. It's got, uh, it's Baroque. It's adorned with olive branches. It's flanked by Asian men in robes and turbans. And of course, at the bottom of the cartouche are two elephants. Uh, and there's a depiction right of the castle of the King of Siam right below that. Uh, the next slide we have should be Central Thailand. 
And that's to show you where it is in the map. There's a blow up of this on the next slide, please. Here, I think you can see about the middle of the, um, the image there, the city of Bangkok or the town of Bangkok there on the river. Um, and the capital just northeast of Bangkok, uh, there's a crown where the capital, depicting the capital, the capital was named Thornberry. It's uh, part of modern day Bangkok and it was built on a small defensible island on the river. Uh, I do want to mention when the French were expelled two years after this map, the history records it as the siege of Bangkok. If you remember, there was a small fortress there. Uh, there were 200 French soldiers in the fort. There were 40,000 Thai soldiers and the Thai soldiers had cannons. So it's not surprising that the French army decided to uh, leave peaceably. The next slide, please. Just going to point out with these last few slides kind of where we are in terms of modern day, uh, modern world. Up on the upper left of the map, there's just a little corner there that's now Bangladesh. It was part of Burma, uh, which since 1989 has been known as Myanmar. Uh, just below that is the kingdom of Pegu. I have no idea how to pronounce Pegu, but we're gonna go with that. Uh, that was lower Burma uh, when it was ruled by the English and it's now part of present day Myanmar. Uh, next to that coming down the map is Arakan which was conquered by the Burmese approximately 100 years after this map was published. So this was an independent kingdom at the time. It's now the Rakhine state of Myanmar. And this area was one of the earliest regions in Southeast Asia to embrace Buddhism, which of course spread well beyond there. Uh, below that to the left, we have the Andaman Islands. Uh, today they are administered by uh, India the indigenous people there are hostile to vis visitors and have very little contact with any other people. And the Indian government does protect their uh, right to privacy. And then finally down towards the bottom of the image, um, you can see a little island there, Pink Island. That's for those of you who've been to Thailand, that's Phuket. I know uh, Jim, you and Lorraine were in Thailand not long ago. And I think you went to Chiang Mai as well, but Chiang Mai uh, would be up just on the border, I think, in the uh, between Pegu and Siam, but I uh, can't find any indication of it there. Uh, the next slide, please. For those of us uh, of a certain age that remember Vietnam, a lot of these names are going to be uh, familiar to us. You see there at the top, or close to the top, we have Tonkin. Uh, today, we call this Northern Vietnam. Uh, I hesitate to call it North Vietnam because I, but it's pretty close to the border there where you, you see the uh, southern border. Uh, Chinin, below that is Vietnam. In the upper right, you can see China. Uh, you can also see in, in their names that you recognize Cambodia and Laos. Um, the next slide depicts um, the French ships that took the uh, ambassador and, and established the embassy. And you can see the dotted line there that carries through. That's the uh, route of the embassy. And that was um, almost undoubtedly added by Duchas after Duval's death because the uh, route is depicted after um, Duval died. And the next slide should be the cartouche. Um, just wanted to point out that there is a huge island of Borneo right underneath the cartouche. It, it was uh, the map maker's decision not to include, include that. And if you would go to the last slide, please. Uh, I think Wes asked the question of Chris about how rare that his map was on the market. Uh, this one is pretty rare. Um, Don McGurk helped me uh, with the research. And as far as we can tell from WorldCat, there are uh, five institutional copies. There are three in private hands, including this one. Uh, there is a map on the market right now with, with, offered by a Belgian dealer. Uh, 
as far as the atlas, I was able to locate one in private hands, but I'm quite sure there are, there are others. And uh, that's the end, unless someone has questions. I have a question for you, Tom. Sure. <laughs> you end up in Thailand. You don't know the region. You don't know maps, anything like that. Why this map? How did, what, how did you, you just went to a map store, saw it, liked it, and I, bought it, or, or you knew that you were going to get it? Uh, the answer to that is kind of yes. I did uh, look for map dealers before I left. There is a map dealer there uh, who's actually from Germany, but he's been in Thailand for 40 years. He specializes in maps of Southeast Asia, so I stopped by his shop, and, um, you know, I like the elephants. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I knew I wanted to get a map of the area to commemorate the trip, and um, I was lucky enough that this one was available. You hit the jackpot. Okay, good. Other questions? What do you think, Tom? Should we proceed? I think so. I think we've got some great speakers coming up. I'm just so happy that I didn't have to follow Wes Brown again this time because he's impossible to follow. And we've got uh, Tad and Max and Don and uh, it's don't, uh, don't go away folks. Mm -hmm. Just gets better. All right. Thank you, Tom. Um, next up we have Don McGurk. Don, would you please um, introduce yourself to everyone? Am I on? Okay, uh, thank you all for being here, especially those who uh, signed in from far away. Your participation is greatly appreciated. Uh, I'm Don McGurk, I've uh, been interested in antique maps for 40 years and uh, a retired pediatrician and a founding member of the Rocky Mountain Map Society. And uh, my talk will be on a map of the United States. Next slide, please. So there's the title, I won't read it all and bore you to death, but it's basically a map of the newly minted uh, United States of America. Click. And there's my copy, it's all in black and white except for a flag that is colored. Next slide, or click. And here's a copy from the uh, uh, Library of Congress, uh, and I'm gonna be using this and you'll and part of my talk, and you'll soon see why. Click. So here's the cartouche. Uh, click. And this particular map was done in 1790 by Sayer and Bennett in London. Click. And here's the uh, uh, Library of Congress copy. Click. And you can see that this is done four years later by a, a different uh, uh, printer, Laura and Whittle. And they were, they had two copies of this map, one 1794 and one undated. Click. So why is this map important? Click. Well, it's, it documents the birth of a nation. It really does. And you're soon going to see why. Uh, the, this nation was born basically on September 3rd, 1783, when the Treaty of Paris was signed between uh, King George III and representatives of the uh, uh, the United States, and it basically defined its uh, independence and boundaries. Next slide. It consisted of 10 articles. Click. The first of those articles just established basically its independence. It says, yep, yeah, you guys are good to go. We're, we won't bother you anymore. Next article. Article two defined the boundaries of the new nation, and we'll show you that in just a second. Click. And article three establishes the fishing rights of the new nation. And I was very surprised that this was the third most important thing, but apparently it was because it's listed number three. Next slide. So if you look closely at this uh, map from the Library of Congress, you can see that everything in green is basically uh, the new United States. And representatives uh, back in the uh, United States of America were quite surprised that they had gained all the land all the way to the Mississippi. Uh, Britain was very uh, generous with its giving away of land. 
Uh, you'll also notice above, you can see that some of the lakes and some of the shorelines uh, up in Canada are also colored green. And what that represented was places where indeed they could fish. Uh, the uh, fishermen from the uh, United States could fish. And in some places they could even land and smoke their fish on the land, but not to be settled by people in the United States. Next slide, please. So a close-up of the, the cartouches on the uh, right and on the left, they write out the whole article. I'm not going to read it. I will not read it to you all be, because it goes on and on. But it's very specific, very specific about where the uh, fishermen from the United States could fish. Next slide, please. So uh, interestingly enough, Article 7 mentioned that would be a firm and perpetual peace between His Maj Britannic Majesty and these states. Well, that didn't quite work out well. And actually, that uh, the Treaty of Paris was broken by the uh, War of 1812. And on the left-hand side, you can see the White House burning down, uh, burned by the British. And on the uh, right-hand side, John Paul Jones fighting off the British in, at sea. Click. And so um, this was not the first representation of the map. The one that I have and have shown you had a small flag above the cartouche. Seven years earlier, uh, Sayer and Bennett had done basically the exact same map, including Article 3. And again, this one is uh, painted green for the uh, limits of the United States. Uh, so where did this come from? Click. Next slide, please. So. Uh, this map was uh, eight years earlier than the map we just showed you, and it was also done by Sayer and Bennett. And you can see that the uh, land or the topography is almost identical to the other two, but their cartouche is somewhat uh, different. Click. And the cartouche says uh, North America from the French of Mr. De Anvil improved. So this has a history as well. One more click. So 20 years before that, uh, Thomas Jeffers in 1755 basically copied the Anvil's map of North America. Click. And in the cartouche, you can see he mentions uh, North America has taken from Mr. De Anvil. So that's sort of the, the, the background to the, to the map and, uh, previous to the uh, 1790. Click. I wanted to uh, do uh, a few close-ups. I can't obviously go into too much detail about the, uh, about the map. Uh, Naomi, four clicks, please. Thank you. So here's Massachusetts, Cape Cod, and you can see Boston and Plymouth. And, and one of the reasons I like this map because it mentions a small town between Boston and Plymouth. And that town is named Situate. It was uh, founded in 1630. And for three years, I practiced uh, pediatrics in that small town. Beautiful, right on the coast, a uh, little harbor. Uh, it was nicknamed the Irish Riviera because the, uh, uh, there were a few uh, wealthy Irishmen in Boston. And in the summer that we'd come down to Plymouth, uh, I'm sorry, we'd come down to Situate and uh, spend their summers there. So it was the Irish Riviera, beautiful little town. Next slide, please. And uh, one click. So here's the Yazoo River, and many of you know why I'm interested in the Yazoo River. It's where the Yazoo Indians were. And my friend Mankash Dape left from the confluence of the Mississippi and the Yazoo River, which you can see on this map, and went all the way to the Pacific Ocean uh, on the Missouri uh, circa 1700. Three clicks. And a number of uh, the Indian tribes are mentioned on this map, the Choc Choctaw, the Creeks, the uh, Cat Indians or the Flathead Indians, and there were others on the map, uh, a significant number of tribes were, were mentioned. Uh, five clicks. 
And scattered across the map are also uh, noted uh, either uh, old forts or small settlements that uh, were included uh, on the map. Next slide, please. So uh, I purchased this map uh, from a uh, obscure uh, map dealer called Chris Lane. A few of you might know him. And uh, he was very nice to sell me this map at the uh, uh, Miami Map Fair. And uh, I purchased it uh, during a uh, time that I was uh, preparing an article for the Portland Magazine. Tom Sander is not with us tonight. You might want to comment. If anyone's interested in reading the article, it's uh, the Stars and Stripes on Early Maps. It shows 13 early maps prior to uh, uh, 1795 that showed the Stars and Stripes. And Tom will give you a plug. If anyone wants to buy that issue, it's issue 103, page 45, in the winter of 2018. And if anyone's interested in person, uh, that portal on, I'm sure Tom would be happy to, to help you do that. And that ends my presentation. Thank you all. Tom, Tom sends out that this issue is available. Naomi? Are we, are there any questions, Jim? No, there aren't. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Don. There's actually a, a, a question there. It says, did the fishing rights map allow U.S. to fish also in James Bay? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think Hudson's Bay, they were allowed to sail. I don't remember anything on James Bay, but I could go back and, uh, and get back to you on that if it's positive, but I, I don't think so. All right. Well, thank you. Um, next up, we have Max Peters. Um, Max, um, I'll put up the slide for you. Um, you can introduce yourself, please. Max, are you muted? Yeah, he is. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Max. Oh, good. There you go. Okay, good. Okay, so I start all over again, yeah? Yes, please. Yeah, that, um, Max Peters, I, you can hear from the accent, I'm not from here, I'm from Holland, in fact. And the reason I came to Colorado was that I was the professor of geophysics for 10 years at the Colorado School of Mines. And that is already long ago. Um, in the meantime, I was the consul for the Netherlands uh, for the three Rocky Mountain states. And one of my other hobbies uh, is patrolling in the open space um, parks and see if everybody behaves. Um, an old proverb uh, says that God created the world and the Dutch created Holland. And in this uh, very short lecture, I hope to prove that proverb. Uh, can I have the next one, please? This landscape, uh, it's not too far from Amsterdam, is typical for Holland because this was originally a big lake and then they built a ring dike around it, uh, got rid of the water, or they're continuing still to get rid of the water, and then divided the whole thing up um, in strips that are owned by uh, uh, farmers. Click. Well, let's orient ourselves for, in, of course, in this company, I don't have to explain where Holland is situated, but just in case, Holland's very small. Look at uh, the scale on the bottom, and it's bordered by the North Sea, Germany, and Belgium. Why do I show this map? Because, um, can you click, uh, Nomi? If there weren't dikes, this part uh, flash colored would be flooded. So almost 40% of the country would be flooded with water if we didn't have proper dikes, only in a small in yellow strip of dunes. And, and then of course the higher elevations are there. To the right, and unfortunately it's just behind uh, our photographs, but it says Luctor and Mergo on the coat of arms there. And you see the line 
coming out of the, the water. This is literally true because it's in um, a coat of arms from one of the countries from Holland. And that, of course, we have done already for more than five centuries, struggling with the water and hopefully beating it. Can I have the next one, please? This is basically the map or the combination of BAM maps that I want to show. Um, it compares the situation in 1844 with that one in 1984. And I apologized for the quality, but on the left hand map, you see big areas in gray, especially the one that I uh, annotated Zuider Zee is a big, big body of water that in fact uh, flooded quite a few times uh, the surrounding land. And um, the other one that I marked is the Haarlemmer Lake. In fact, um, the Schiphol Airport is situated on the bottom of that lake, and now of course it is drained. And Schiphol itself means a hiding place for boats. So the aeronautics and the maritime interests are merged in a strange way there. Um, from 1844 to 1984, almost 20% of the surface of the Netherlands was reclaimed. So a very substantial part. And can I have a number of clicks? Uh, yeah, carry on. All this marked has been reclaimed uh, from this either the sea or from lakes that were uh, drained. So it is a very important part of Holland, the uh, reclaimed uh, area. To the right, you see the modern situation and in basically all the green colored parts were recovered. So again, it, it's very extensive. And almost 30%, and I mentioned that before, of the surface of the Netherlands is below sea level, which sometimes makes visitors a little bit uneasy, but uh, we have the built dikes that uh, were quite recently, due to the clim climate uh, changes, were upgraded to a thousand year storm. So basically, unless of course the statistics play havoc with us, we should be very safe. Next, please. Now, what you see here are four lakes. Well, not lakes anymore because they were drained. And that was done in the end of the 17th century. Why do I show it? Well, it is basically the map that shows the connection between mapping and developing. Because you see all those nice uh, uh, areas, rectangles next to each other, when companies who invested in the drainage of the, the lakes um, had a, a, a dry land available, of course they wanted to sell it. But the, the Dutch already in those days were rather equally disposed, so they made sure that the parcels and the situation was almost the same for everybody. But you see there are thousands and thousands of new farms that uh, were created, not too far from uh, Amsterdam and Rotterdam, so there was a ready market for all the products that were uh, produced. Now, of course, it was essential that they kept working on the, the water. So there were windmills in those days that uh, made sure that all the water was removed to the ring dike and from the ring dike that you see here uh, around the, the former lakes to the sea. If you don't do that, you get wet feet and then of course you are in trouble. And uh, they made, based on maps like this, pretty important decisions, in fact, Every polder, every ring dyked piece of land had its own governors that took care of um, well, all the repairs, um, the, the, the sale of new land and so on. So the map played a very, very important part in the managing and the continuation of the polders. That's about all I wanted to say. So uh, if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer those. Questions, please. I have a question, please. With all of this reclamation, is there still places to ice skate? 
Oh, <laughs> only just. But, uh, unfortunately, climate change, of course, has changed uh, or reduced that as well. The last time we had uh, the famous uh, um, 160 mile race through Frisia uh, has not been run since 1981. Are there more questions? Okay. Thank you so much, Max. That was a really good presentation. Very interesting. And so a good story, you know, a different kind of story than what we've been uh, hearing. One, one quick question, Max. Uh, the name the ne Netherlands, is that come from like the lowlands or what, what would be the translation of that? Um, yes, indeed. The nader, the, the first part means low. Yeah. Pays uh, bas in French, which also means then uh, the land that is low. In fact, uh, Napoleon didn't have an, uh, much respect for Holland. He called it uh, the sediment of the Rhine. <laughs> Max, would this be the Plattdeutsch? Uh, well, we would prefer not to call it Plattdeutsch because uh, throughout the ages, we haven't been on very friendly terms with the Germans. But you, you're right. In fact, in the uh, old maps I have, uh, it, it's called a bastardized dialect from German. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, if I can add to that, in fact, the people in the northern part of Germany and Dutch people can understand each other very well. The, 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 there is only a gradual difference between the two languages. Thanks all for your attention. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, next up we have um, Wes Brown. Hello, can you hear me? I have to say that I'm so happy. I've been involved with the MAP Society for a very long time, since 1991 when Don McGurk and I worked on putting the group together. And it's so fun to see many of the faces I've missed. And I will just note Bill Reeser has been a member of our society for decades, living in Northwestern Wyoming. And you finally now get to attend a meeting of ours, Bill. So happy to see your face in particular. <laughs> uh, I know. For, for me, COVID's an advantage. <laughs> yeah, well, we're really happy to. I was delighted to see you show up. Uh, so it's thank you all for great presentations. letting me talk about this map. Go on to the, next, the first map, please, Naomi. Uh, it was an opportunity for adventure, discovery, and service to the nation. In 1845, young lieutenants James Abair and William Peck explored the rugged terrain of southeastern Colorado, northeastern New Mexico, the panhandle of Texas, and Oklahoma. The following year, they produced a map of their, their exploration that you see here. The map shows what was then the desolate corner where three countries joined, the Republic of Texas, Mexico, and the southwestern edge of the United States. Now, 15 years later, much of the land shown on the map became the territory of Colorado. And no other map of this quality had ever been focused on this area alone. So as a Colorado native, of course, I love this map and want to tell you more about it. Next slide, please. Along with the map, Hebert wrote a journal of the expedition for the US Senate that displays his keen talent for observation. There we go. Uh, special insights into the native population, a love of science and nature and exciting adventures. And as an armchair traveler with the map in your lap and the book in your hand, uh, you can just smell the sagebrush and feel the baking sun on your neck as you read through the daily log of their 10 week enterprise. Next slide. The historical background surrounding this, surrounding this map is important to its understanding. In 1845, the United States initiated the process to annex the Republic of Texas, which concluded at the end of that year. And as a result, war with Mexico was imminent and the US government felt great urgency to obtain geographical information about the potential areas of conflict. It was imperative to better understand the course of the west to east flowing Arkansas River, vital to the Santa Fe Trail. 
and for years an international boundary, first with Mexico and then with the Republic of Texas. Of equal importance was the course of the Canadian River that roughly parallels the Arkansas about 150 miles to its south. Given the current state of politics, the previously uncharted desolate land of the Canadian was the primary range of the fierce Comanche and Cayo Indians. It could become a theater of war. Now, Captain John Charles Fremont, who had recently led two renowned Western expeditions, initially led the survey of the Arkansas and the Canadian rivers. Lieutenants Hebert and Peck were assistants along with this group. Next page, next slide. They reached Bent's Fort on the Arkansas that you see here illustrated by Hebert, who was an excellent artist. Since 1834, Bent's Fort had been the principal trading post for many of the Plains Indians for hundreds of miles in all directions. Now Fremont disobeyed orders as he often did and went to California, instead leaving the two 24-year-old lieutenants to lead the expedition of the Canadian River. This is a wonderful opportunity for these young officers to be in command. Peck was possessed of outstanding mathematical ability and had ranked first in his West Point class. In contrast, Hebert seems to have excelled in collecting demerits at West Point and ranked 55th of 56 graduating cadets. Yet he gained the respect of his men and by the conclusion of the Civil War, held the rank of major. Next slide. When they crossed the Arkansas from Bent's Fort to the south, the company of 33 men left Indian Territory of the United States and entered the Republic of Texas. They followed the Purgatory River southwest over Raton Pass, where Interstate 25 connects Colorado to New Mexico and join the headwaters of the Canadian just south of the pass. This they followed about 75 miles south and then about 450 miles east, ending their expedition at Fort Gibson in eastern Oklahoma. This was desolate country, the hostile territory of the Comanche and Kiowa Indians. It may have been part of Texas, but it was only Texas in name. It very much was controlled by these Indians. They saw no fixed habitation for 300 miles, except a small trading house that had been established the year before. Think of that, 300 miles. Next slide. You see on the map where they left the Canadian River to the south to try to find the smaller Washita River. It was this side excursion for eight days that was the most challenging. As they were without guides, with no prior mapping, and in the most hostile terrain. The journal for September 17th opens, and I wanna read you some of these sections. Quote, this is the day which we shall look back upon in our wanderings as the day of anxiety. We entered upon the famous tableland known to the Spaniards as El Llano Estacado, we know of as the Staked Plains. As they, end quote, as they traveled for hours, quote, our tongues seemed to cleave to the roofs of our mouths and our throats were parched with dryness. The rude joke, joke and the boisterous laugh had long since died away and the hep of the driver as he urged his panting team under the scorching sun grew fainter and fainter until we moved on in dead silence." Unquote. He describes the remarkable emotions that desperate travelers often experience, quote, the idea of having been misled evidently began to steal into our minds. Though not a word was spoken, this sort of depression akin to fear is contagious. And as we pursued our way, each one examined his rifle and closed in with the main body. An Indian mounted now appeared. And as he swept along the horizon, looked as a very giant, Another and another burst upon our view on every side, which led us to believe that we were surrounded." End quote. 
This longest day eventually led them to a stream, which was the North Fork of the Red River. Uh, you see it on the map mistakenly labeled as the Washita, where there was fresh water and grass. Quote, the camp was completely metamorphosed from gloomy despair to glad delight. <clears throat> some laughed, some whistled, others sung as they descended to the river. Hebert concludes, quote, the day which had begun in gloom and despair ended in joyful mirth, a fact that shows the contagious nature of both fear and joy, as well as illustrates the sudden changes a man's mind may undergo. <coughs> Upon uh, arriving home, Hebert and Peck prepared their field notes and Hebert wrote his journal. Charles Preuss, the German trained immigrant who produced all the renowned maps of J.C. Fremont, made this map uh, for publication. The map and the journal was published the next year, 1846, uh, for the U.S. Senate, which was desperate for this uh, information. Next slide. This image uh, of the Spanish peaks is one of 10 engraved images uh, contained in the journal. Uh, Hebert uh, was quite an artist and uh, you see this example here. Uh, he was not only an, an outstanding artist who produced 100 sketches, but also 40 watercolors on his trip. Next slide, please. And here you see a painting of Owl Woman, uh, wife of William Bent of Bent's Fort. Hebert later taught drawing at West Point uh, for two years. Uh, and and uh, because this information, cartographic rendering was so critical and uh, images of forts and all for the cadets. And he developed a method of coloring maps to enhance his, their understanding. Next slide, please. And it is believed that my map is colored in that, it is certainly colored in that exact fashion uh, and is believed to be a rare example of a map hand colored by Hebert himself. So to conclude, the map by itself is an important cartographic achievement, but it is by reading the daily travels in the journal, tracing each day on the map, that makes it a precious document. Thanks. Tad, it looks like you're next. Um. Are there any questions for Wes before we move on? All right, thank you. Um, Tad, you're going to share your own. Yes, I think you're, Naomi, I think you're, you're muted. Okay. Um, well, thank you all. Um, uh, the conventional wisdom in the Rocky Mountain Map Society is never follow Wes Brown, um, but here I am. So we're going to give this a try. Um, my name is Tad Kelly. Um, a big, uh, big thank you uh, to uh, Angel and, and, and Naomi for organi uh, organizing this and Jim for sort of moderating the discussion. Uh, it's fun to be able to do this. Um, I've been collect collecting maps of Etruria, Tuscany, and Central Italy for almost 25 years, and the the topic of uh, today's um, the, the map um, is a, a 1773 map on uh, which I'm going to share with you right now. I'm going to take over the the driving wheel here. So this is a uh, a map by Matteo Pagani, who is a little known. Um, Italian publisher, and it's of the Grand Duchy of Tuscany. And as you all are familiar, um, the Great Renaissance began here, and um, they say that 70% uh, of Renaissance art is in uh, Tuscany, and in uh, if you include Rome in Tuscany, and about 70% of that 70% is resident in, uh, in Florence itself, uh, which is why so many people go there. Um, the, um, I bought this map in 2001 from an, a, um, a prominent uh, book dealer in Florence who had just bought an entire library from an aristocratic um, 
Italian family uh, who had a castle nearby, apparently, and that is going to become maybe relevant later on. Um, the question is um, not um, about the, the rarity of this map, although I've only seen two copies uh, in 25 years, uh, nor is it necessarily the beauty of the map, although it's, it's, it's uh, certainly the lower left-hand corner, if you want to call that a second kind of cartouche, um, it's, it's actually quite beautiful. Um, and I'll be zooming in uh, later for some things. But as you can see, um, the, um, the green outline color uh, divides Tuscany into two portions, an upper left-hand portion, which is called Lulignana, which uh, at the time was allied with uh, the Grand Duchy of, of Tuscany. Um, and then there's the central portion, which you can see, which takes up uh, most of, of the map. But what's fascinating about this map, again, is not the map itself, but what's on the map. Um, and the mystery is, um, who was the original owner of this map? So I'm inviting you to speculate with me, and I have a few ideas, but I don't have a definitive answer. So I'm gonna uh, take you on a quick tour of Tuscany um, by zooming in here. And you'll recognize that um, on the coast here, you'll see Pisa. Can some of you see my little pointer? It's sort of a, a little bit, it's hard to see, but. Anyway, there's Pisa, um, and the Arno, of course, comes in from the Mediterranean. And as you follow this across, you follow the Arno across, you see there's Florence right in the middle there. Um, and right on the Arno, many of you have been to Florence, sometimes several times, I presume. And then if you go basically due south of Florence is the, the medieval city of Siena, which is right in the middle there. And then some of you are familiar with San Gimignano, which is that famous town that has, still has the towers that the uh, noble families would, would build and compete with each other. Whoever had the tallest tower had the most money and most prestige. Um, and what's interesting about this map, just to sort of lead you into it, is you'll notice here that there are red and gray pencil lines going north and south. And those lines were added using some kind of ruler device all across the map by the owner of this map. And the question is, why? And I will try to answer that question because that's pretty clear. This person was very interested in figuring out what the surface area of Tuscany was. And if you follow these lines, they line up with the longitudinal and latitudinal parts of the map at the top and the bottom and to the sides, which I'll quickly, not to make you too dizzy, but you can see they also line up over here. And so he created many boxes. Uh, and I say he, it might have been a woman, um, but I'm just going to say he for the benefit of um, not having to say he or she in the presentation. So if you go to the right-hand side, here we are. The person added up the boxes from the very top of the map of Tuscany, where there's just one, four, 14, 28, all the way down to where the, it shrinks again. Of course, it gets sort of wide in the middle. It shrinks again. And this person adds them all up to a total down here. Then there's this area, uh, Lulignana, 550, 550, 589, which gets us back to this part of the map. There it is. There's the 589 over here. So he's adding that portion, again, not to make you dizzy, but to what he added up at the top on the right-hand side, to get a total. Then this person converts the boxes into, um, into square miles. That's right there, miles, geographic miles. And the conversion rate um, is exactly 1.35. So it converts that into 8569-9013. You can obviously miles, if you go to the left-hand side of the map here, you can see that there are obviously, as we all know, 
um, each country had its own way of measuring. So these are, the well, second thing down, there's Florentine, Florentine miles and there's geographic miles. So he converts the longitudinal and latitudinal boxes into these miles. And then what does he do? He compares the total that he came up with to the surface area that other people had come up with prior to him. And it says here, the surface area of Tuscany has variously been calculated by various authors as, and then he mentions these authors, he goes down, these are different people um, that are predecessors of his, and compares the 9166, which he came up with, which is the Florentine portion of Tuscany with the, the Pisano, the, the, from Pisa, upper Sienese and lower Sienese. And he compares it to these other people. The only person I can seem to find any history of is Targioni, who's very well known um, and was an immediate um, predecessor in terms of chronology um, to whoever owned this map. Um, the reason that we know that this is um, contemporary and that the owner was, the, was bought it at the time around 1773 is that all of these people um, precede him in terms of geography. There are no, if you want to call these people geographers, there are no geographers listed here that are after 1770. Now, what's really interesting here, to me, the most interesting is the lower left. If you look at the manuscript, and I'm going to shrink this down so everyone can see it, you can see all of it. So with this is, this is the writing that this person writes. And what they write is they say, there are various um, maps of Tuscany by, and these are names you'll all recognize, Magini, Baudron, Rouge, Sanson, De Witt, Mayer. And these are maps of Tuscany that included the ecclesiastical state. So think of sort of central. And these are, these are people um, who are pretty much in chronological order from 1608 to 1748. Then he goes on to say, Tuscany by Bellarmato from Siena issued maps in 1558, 1563, copied by Ortelius in 1570, by Mercator, 1595. And he goes on and on. And he has a pretty complete list of other maps of Tuscany by people that preceded him by over 200 years. So the question is, how could somebody in 1773, there are no, there's no internet, there's no, there are no books about maps of Tuscany. How could this person know that Bel Armado issued the very first map of Tuscany? Um, and going all the way up, and you can see there's 16, 1609, uh, 1620, all the way up to 1745, again, no maps issued after 1773. So these are all this person's predecessors. The question is, who is this person? How could they have known all of this information, geographic information and historical information and historical cartographic information? So again, I invite you to speculate with me. And I'll, and I'll start by saying that I don't think that this person was a mathematician. And the reason that I say that is there are several addition errors in the numbers here. Because um, I added these all up several times, several addition and subtraction numbers. Um, so I'm pretty sure this person was not a mathematician. Anybody that would go to the trouble of doing all of these lines and then not add them up correctly should tell you something. Second, I would say this person is not a geographer. And the reason I would say that is if you look at the left-hand side of the page here, you'll see that he actually puts Florence, which is to the right here, on this map as 43 degrees, 46 minutes and 15 seconds. But if you look at the side here, he actually puts it in the wrong spot. He actually takes 43, which is down towards the bottom here, 
10, 20, 30, 40 minutes. And a, a geographer would know that if you divide 40 minutes and 50 minutes into 10 little squares there, each one would be six seconds. And instead, he says 40, he basically divides it into 10 and goes 45, 50, 55, 60. Anyway, he gets up to 46. It's actually in, in six seconds, and it would be 43, 38. So he obviously got this, this latitudinal number from a different place and placed it incorrectly on the map because he did not understand how latitudes worked. So my speculation is not a cartographer, not a geographer. So what does that leave us with? I, I don't have the answer, so I invite you to speculate and I'll just have one, I, one minute left here. Um, I'm guessing that this person um, had access to the library in this castle. And this, the library in this castle actually had these maps in it, in its library, which would have been very, very impressive. For instance, the original map by Bella Amato, there's only one surviving copy in the world. It happens to be in Florence. Um, but I think this person was a historical uh, uh, historian, maybe a cartographic historian, who went through the library. This was the last, the latest map of Tuscany that the library had acquired. And he was trying to do some historical research based on what he thought the surface area of Tuscany was, that this would be more accurate a map. And it's true, they got more accurate, of course, as we all know over time, than the previous maps. But he also wanted to talk about the previous maps of Tuscany that he had chronicled based upon the information he had available to him in that library. And I'll stop with that. But I, I, I welcome any other speculation as to who owned this map. Can yeah. I ask a, a question, Dad? Of course. So did, did you have an opportunity to go to the Vatican uh, Library? I understood that they have whole areas there that are unexplored and, and perhaps a few of the maps might still be there. Um, I have, I, that is on my list of to-dos. Um, I've been working about 10 years. You cannot, unlike the other um, libraries in Italy, most of which I've had access to, the Vatican Library, you need a special invitation. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm, I've been working on that for about 10 years. I think I'm getting close. But, um, but the, there's a, a very famous um, geographer, um, Vladimir, um, uh, his name was, I'm sorry, um, uh, Almaja, who did a, has a, a large book which, which um, catalogs all of the maps of Italy that are in the Vatican, um, which I've been using so far to sort of figure that out. I don't think they have this map in the Vatican Library, but they might. Uh, so it's a very interesting presentation. Great uh, presentation. Have you compared the, um, you know, the, the number he came up with, with today's uh, geography of Tuscany? Um, I love that question. The answer is I have not had a chance to do that. The other, the, the other challenge with that is the way that Tuscany has been defined over the centuries changes all the time. And so um, you really, there are, there's no way to do an apples and apples comparison. So Tuscany today is defined differently than Tuscany is on this map. Um, and which is why this particular person's attempt to make that comparison is probably faulty because the geography had, has changed, had changed when, he, when he did it. So it would be inaccurate. Like Rome would, was considered part of Tuscany for a while. And then it wasn't because it became its own um, uh, own part of Italy, separate part of Italy. And then yeah. the, Pope, the Pope over time had more of Italy and less of Italy as the as the Medici's became more powerful, less powerful. One of them, of course, became a Pope himself. There's a whole, of course, history that we all have heard of there. Ted, are you aware of any other maps in private or public hands that have the same set of, of uh, latitude and longitude markings. And maybe there's maybe this person did that to some of the other maps. How did he get his answers about the land area of the other maps to compare? Uh, that's a mystery that I, that I have not been able to solve because I, I'm, I can't find 
the the names other than Targioni, I don't I can't find the names of those other people as geographers, as, as cartographers in any um, literature. But I'm guessing there maybe was a book by those people that speculated on maybe the surface area of Tuscany in their time. I just don't know. It's a great question. Thank you. Angel, it looks like we've wrapped it up pretty well. Uh, yes, we have. And uh, we have come to the end of our favorite maps event and the end of our first remote uh, lecture. It was great to see a lot of our members that have now joined us in this new medium and also see some of our, all of our friends from other societies. What this tells you is that even though uh, this may seem like sad times that we don't get to see each other, we got to make the, mess, the best of, of, of uh, what we have. Just like on that September 17, 1845 day, the day of anxiety that, uh, that Wes was talking about with Avert and, 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 uh, and Peck, that turned what was gloomy despair into joyful times. That's what we should do uh, using this uh, new remote medium to enjoy these great lectures and, and, and great presentations. So thank you to all of our, our speakers that, uh, is, uh, that gave us such a great description of their favorite maps. It's always good to see people passionate about their maps because that opens up new areas for us to get interested and also new areas in which we are, have to purchase new maps. So that's a, that's a different story. But uh, thank you all for, for coming and, and, and uh, be on the lookout for Naomi's announcements by Facebook, by email, by mail about uh, our next event. And we hope to see you under these same conditions um, next time.